Welcome back, everybody, to another live stream. Uh, we've got a pretty awesome one. Our guests are coming in live from Arizona at the campground. And the topic of today is bike components and how one chooses their parts for their bike. Um, let me just get things set up real quick. And OK. Uh, if you guys enjoy this content, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff, or hit up the merch store. We still have a bunch of our Save the Front Derailleur stickers. And speaking of saving the front derailleur, uh, we've got Ron, co-host, and uh, Adam Sklar. How are you guys doing? Yeah, middle, middle name, Front Derailleur. <laughs> middle name, Front Derailleur. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you guys at? You guys are in Arizona? We are. We are in the um, the... Uh, gravel dad capital of Arizona right now, um, Patagonia, the San Rafael Valley. Shout out to anyone 60 to 70 out here right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's for roadie cyclists go to retire and ride the that's gravel, it, right? That's it. That's why we're here. <laughs> it's a great spot. Great. A great spot. And you, meet, you really do meet some pretty, pretty fun people out here too, which are out, out there enjoying gravel bikes on, in their retirement, which is pretty cool. So yeah, cool. we're out here vacationing because, you know, we are, we live that retired lifestyle or we try to, <laughs> we can. So occasionally. occasionally. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so Adam or Adam, Ronnie, Ron, is it Randall? Randall Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Randall Adam Sklar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I did. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so you're. Uh, for those that may not know, um, you're based in Bozeman, and you make bikes, right? That's right. I own a little bike company called Sklar Bikes. Cool. Bozeman. And it's cold and snowy there now, so it's it's really nice <laughs> to be down here. Nice. Um, so I guess what we were talking about today is components. Uh, Ron, you proposed this. Like, there's kind of an art in uh, choosing parts for a, a bike build. Um, I'm curious, like, how would you... you, you how would you guys define your your personal style in terms of choosing components for your bike? Are you like neo retro, retro grouch, or all electronic everything? <laughs> Definitely the latter. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I always loved that term. Go. I remember first first learning about the, the retro grouch uh, um, uh, moniker. You know, when I was six, when I was sixteen, and into the techest stuff. <laughs> which is exactly what is retro grouchy now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I hope this gust of wind doesn't doesn't really blow our spot here. I think um, it, it's holding up. It's holding up. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, for me, definitely. You know, I like to my my current um, palette is influenced by what the what we viewed the future to look like in 1985, <laughs> and that is that's been my like. That's been what I've d been designing things around lately. Um, nice. And uh, so that's, a little, you know, retro grouch futurist. <laughs> definitely grouch, you know, definitely grouchy about it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's where I am. Yeah. You know? How about the, you, Adam? Uh, you get to spec out uh, customer bikes and your own personal bikes. Like, uh, mm -hmm. what do you gravitate towards? Yeah, it's been interesting building really high end bikes. I tend to spec out a lot of bikes with the fanciest most expensive like whatever the industry is really pushing at the moment so i've gotten to experience a lot of those parts but i think for my personal bikes i fall somewhere in the middle of ron and what the industry is pushing so i like i prefer all mechanical stuff i like hydraulic brakes still definitely disc brakes rim brakes um i'm trying them out right now but He's trying. Um, he's trying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like, I think bikes are simple. I like, I like that they're simple machines and they're, you know, you can fix them in the field. And I used to be a single speeder. So I like stuff that just works and you don't have to think about it too much. And so I'm not loyal to any aesthetic or anything like that, but I like stuff that works good and you can work on. Yeah. So my Yobi. I love that you're a, a um, you know, Randall's background He's an old soul, you know, <laughs> an old soul, but background being 
you know, rigid single speed two nine or mountain bikes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is, you know, definitely someone, you know, 20 years older than them. This year. <laughs> <laughs> we went through that phase. <laughs> we were all there, you know, and so I feel like that's how, that's why yeah. even though we're, we're, a, we're decades apart, that's how we were able to get along so well. It's 13, 14 years though. Yeah. <laughs> so we were talking a little, a little bit, uh, off camera, um, and you you put the front derailleur on the bike for the first time in, in a while. How was how was that experience? <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Uh, <laughs> I just built myself a new. I've been hanging out with Ron too much, and <laughs> clearly a bad influence. So I sort of built it as an art project. This uh, it's kind of somewhere between a rando bike and a road bike. It's got thirty eight seven hundred by thirty eights on there, and some cool old Suntour derailleurs. So it's I don't know nine, nice. yeah. nine in the back. Nine. Two in the front. <laughs> you believe that? Nine. Um, it was, yeah. That's uh, 18 speeds, I believe. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it was really fun. Today was the first, actually, I rode around Tucson a bit last week, but today was the first time. And, you know, it's really fun. I guess that's part of the more I get into, like, building super fancy titanium all-carbon out bikes, part of me wants to push back a bit and ride simpler stuff. And you can really have fun on any bike. And that bike was super fun, just as much fun as my cool titanium bike I rode yesterday. Yeah. There's a definite like charm to older components that I don't think the newer stuff has. You know, like I love like digging around through like a bike co-op and unearthing, you know, old Suntour or um, you know, like Dior Deer Head stuff. And it, there, there's something about it that's like, ooh, this is cool that as an object that I don't think like a DI2 um derailleur or SRAM uh, access derailleur is going to have in the future. Certainly. I'm starting to get grouchy here. So. <laughs> no, don't say those words. Say those words. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it is. It's, you know, the there was a certain point where I like to point to like Y2K where nothing after Y2K will ever be collectible uh, <laughs> because it was when we just took a, a giant dump on, on anything, you know, with any sort of stuff. Everything's after that looks like it was designed by Ed Hardy or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like uh, things became more and more outsourced. Uh, you know, uh, companies like Shimano and Caprignolo started to spend a lot less time on the finish of the products. Um, you know, not, not everything is made in Italy or Japan anymore. Um, and so you have like, you know, everything's going to a lower price point. So the, the materials are different. So really when you pick up a, a you know, a pre Y2K component, and you hold it in your hand and you nice and heavy, and I, really yeah. heavy. <laughs> <laughs> See this drill? Just can barely hold on. Just to take it. a drill to it. Start. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I like I my era is is the you know is 1990 to like 97 or so. That's where I think the best stuff was made. Campagnolo went a, a good ways into the 2000s just because they refused to upgrade their um, bottom bracket system of course they they famously use square tapers well after <laughs> the, the industry had moved on um carbon fiber square taper cranks that's like nice <laughs> <laughs> um, you know so I, I find i also find it interesting that the last the last time that the the tour was ever won on a quill stem is 1999 too is when it's oh ah, really interesting yeah yeah um and you know, I love looking at those old pictures because it's, it's still it's a carbon bike and everything, you know, it's a Trek OCLV carbon on the dome, you know, and he's and it's got a quill stem. And he's, That's right. <laughs> and, you know, so. yeah. yeah. Have you guys seen the the new stuff from uh, Shimano, the Shimano Qs? We were mm-hmm. talking about that around the campfire today. last night. Yeah. Yeah. Does that give you the, the warm and fuzzies or or kind of <laughs> the makes opposite me, direction? It makes me grouchy. Yeah. <laughs> I think it seems cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there's some things about it I appreciate. Like, I, I, I like that, you know, there's, they're kind of going to unify the cable pole. There's going to be some, uh, mm-hmm. or better cross compatibility with, within queues, but it sucks that, you know, anything, you know, uses 11 speed cable pole. So, like, all the old stuff is, isn't going to shift well. And even friction shifters um, that are, that don't pull enough cable aren't going to uh, work with it. So, yeah, that part's not cool, but it, it, it makes it's like what they should have done a long time ago. So <laughs> that part seems cool, but it'll, it'll continue to be. Uh, yeah, I want to build. I think I'll build up a bike for myself with it. It seems it seems pretty neat. 
Yeah. So Adam, what was your experience building up uh, customer bikes like in the middle of the pandemic and sourcing components? Like, did yeah. you have to get creative or did people just wait? <laughs> a little bit of both. Um, it was really, really frustrating. Yeah. It, uh, you know, yeah, stuff was almost entirely not available. And so I, I stopped offering complete bikes altogether, which is a third of my business. So that was pretty <laughs> brutal. <laughs> But yeah, some stuff getting creative or like customers would find stuff on eBay or send it to me and which is really hard because part of the advantage of having me build a bike is like I've got my checklist and I, I do it every week so I can make sure everything, you know, we have all the cable ferrules and stuff you always forget. Mm -hmm. But it was just every build was a nightmare and it was <laughs> six months waiting on rims and it seems like we're finally over it, but it was it was very stressful and and a lot of demand for builds too, I suppose. A lot of demand for builds too, down. yeah, because there's nowhere. I think a lot of people got frames through that who maybe are just getting them built up now because mm -hmm. now stuff's available. So, yeah, that was really frustrating. And yeah, we had to make some creative choices on some some parts or some things. Were like, well, here's here's what you can get. So, yeah, that was that was pretty pretty tough. Yeah. So you just came out with um, your first kind of production bike the super something and were those you sold those as frame only's or did you do any completes of those i sold those just as frame sets and that was yeah that project spent about two years in the work so a big part of that decision was the state of parts <laughs> but also I'm, I'm excited it's such a versatile frame set that i think people are going to build them up in all sorts of cool ways so i'm actually i'm super excited to see how everyone imagines them um you know, the parts landscape right now is pretty vast. Even I think yeah. people have gotten really creative with what was a, what was and wasn't available during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and I think through channels like this and other people, it's like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, um, literature and videos and things like that out there that steer people on a different path. Totally. Yeah. And it's, it's just neat to see something like a build that's just not a stock. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, like. And totally. build, yeah, yeah. And that's like what people expect from me. And I think people, yeah, I'm excited to see all the wacky stuff that people do. And mm -hmm. like I'm building them up for friends with on a budget. So we're going to the bike co-op and we're finding cranks. We're finding shifters and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's such a fun part of bikes to make, make your bike yourself, make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you guys, have you guys played with any of the, like the, the Chinese third party groups? That's like Sensa or LT Wu. Um, I have not. Is, does S Ride fall into that? Oh, I've tried S Ride stuff. I put, yeah. stuff I put, I put S Ride on a couple bikes. Chain, I've just used chains and cassettes. Yeah. It just I won't, won't use any other any modern draft rear around or front around or something. But yeah. the the uh, so yeah that that I put the, the like twelve speed on some friends super somethings and mm -hmm. so far so good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot. There's a lot of third party. Yeah. Just chain. Just cassettes and. Uh, um, like wide range nine speed cassettes, wide range seven speed cassettes. Like <laughs> hilarious with what you can do out there with all that stuff, and it doesn't cost that much to try it out. You yeah. know, like thirty bucks for a <laughs> yeah cassette. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, some of them, some of them, I haven't, I haven't had any issues. Some of them weigh a little bit more than others, but mm -hmm. I'm always looking for those uh, those SRAM uh, nine ninety uh, nine speed uh, dome power dome cassettes. Mm -hmm. Those are the the lightest that I'm aware of. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, I'll use. <laughs> so I'm curious, are there any components uh, when you guys do a personal bike build that, that has to be on your bike? Like this, this is like, you know, the, the one thing that makes it on every single bike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm a big white industries fanboy, So I usually do their cranks and headset. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm a big Paul uh, Paul, uh, Paul Rimbrake, mm. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I and I do feel I do love the way they set up and um, how adjustable they are. The part of what got me really back into rim brakes was how it, uh, how adjustable they are and how you could really um, just by you know uh, fiddling around with a few different factors, you can make the brake feel entirely different and mm -hmm. uh, tune it to the way that you you like it. Um, and the Paul brakes really lend well to that sort of adjust fine tuning and adjustment so that's pretty cool so yeah that's pretty much my thing but i'm trying to think of something more, more i like their, for flat bars too the paul 
I know they're expensive, but those levers are. I think when I was getting into bikes, oh, they're one of the things I saw around that was like, whoa, that's the bar- cool. The barrel adjusters. And they feel so nice. mess around with yeah. the barrel adjusters all day long. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do. Cutting <laughs> along. Those big there. barrel adjusters <laughs> are so nice. <laughs> yeah, I got a, a pair of the, the levers for my hardtack, and they are expensive, but like compared to even like Shimano or um, some like Soma stuff I've tried, they're like super like rigid there's like no play like no yeah. vertical play you know like the barrel adjusters are awesome you know they've got the split so it's easy to take the cable out and it's yeah. just these little refinements that um and if you ride bikes long enough you, you appreciate you, do. you, do. you could put them on like they'll last forever you could put them on 10 different bikes oh and the adjustable reach too like uh yeah. like on aria's bikes she is the hands are like half the size of mine so mm-hmm. of course we're not going to ride the same brake lever Mm-hmm. And uh, you could adjust the the reach on all those levers to make them a lot closer to the bar, which mm-hmm. is nice. Yeah. Which is your? I'm curious. Which is your favorite Paul rim brake? Oh, good oh. question. Oh, I, I do. I, I'm a connoisseur. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I personally really I I really loved um, I really loved the uh, the Neo Motos. Or the, oh, well, I'm saying that right. The Moto Light. Yeah, that's like the mini V. The mini V one, the Moto Light. I really like the Moto Light uh, um, for a long time there, just on my like uh, using it as a front brake. I like to, to mull it up because it does have a lot of, uh, it's got like a quick modulation that stops real quick. And, and uh, so it, it ends up being like a like a nice, powerful front brake where, of course, 80 to 90% of your, your braking traction, braking power is, it depends upon where your, what your handlebar setup is. But mm-hmm. Really liked that using that in the rear and a touring canty in the. I mean, sorry, that in the front and a touring canty in the rear was mm-hmm. is a really really nice setup and it's good for bags to run that because it's not a, you know, you don't you have a the noodle coming all the way down so you're not clamping the, the straddle cable or anything, which, which I thought was going to be a bigger deal but it really, <laughs> like I clamp right around it. Sometimes yeah. I put a little in there but I don't clamp around it. Hmm. That, that is a good combo. Like I, I got a chance to try, you know, all the the Paul rim brakes, and that was the combo that I came up with. I love the feel of the the touring canty in the rear. Like I feel like it's good, good braking power, good modulation. Um, the, the tip with the touring canty, you know, that was like the last iteration of cantilevers that were available to the market before Shimano introduced the V brake, or I guess other other people, more innovations into introduced the V brake first. But Shimano came out with the V brake and made cantilevers obsolete but as you remember they were using prior to that they were using the low profile cantilevers with that plastic um uh, center uh, uh straddle cable that didn't allow for much adjustment at all yeah you, you look at a lot of those setups they're like all in and the the uh the yoke is way high and you could tell there's no mechanical advantage you know you want you could, you could see there's no right angle or acute angle there it's like wide open so the, there's no power in those brakes at all and it gave cantilevers a really bad rap um, yeah you know, when you're using a low profile cantilever when you don't have that big lever of the of the arms on like a retro like a mafac or a, or the paul uh, neo retro you've got to lower that yoke as far down as you can on the tire almost <laughs> dragging on the tire, dragging on the tire. <laughs> it's but, it's counterintuitive because it feels good in the lever when it's up high but like exactly there's right. it, there's yep. way less uh, braking power precisely yeah yeah so that's a that's a common common misconception is there um I'm curious, is there any component that's no longer produced that you guys wish uh, someone would, would bring back? Ooh. Hmm. That's always been my MO to something like that. I'll, I'll try and make it. <laughs> <laughs> or Matt will press back. Up. <laughs> um, man, that's tough. Uh, oh, th- these are good. That's a good question. Um, I mean, more square taper cranks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every I feel like every manufacturer should still be should should just drop it all and and <laughs> you know, go go off on square taper. <laughs> he doesn't like square taper just because it, they're because they're difficult to the, size. You can feel the power no. like evaporating. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's planing, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's different. <laughs> Cr- got, crank bottom bracket base planing. Yeah, those outboard <laughs> bearings. They're not, the bearings are crap. They're small. They're way <laughs> out, way quicker. I will. Yeah, the bottom. There is the bottom bracket thing. But... Yeah, the bottom brackets are junk. <laughs> for when I switched on my old on my old single speed, uh-huh. when I switched from 
the white industry square tank for to the 30 and i was like whoa and I feel like <laughs> my i'm going this is going into moving forward now <laughs> so easy. That's what you want to burn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but, totally... it's a, but there's nothing wrong with square tanks. Yeah. Also, yeah. I wrote them today, and they were my cranks are actually bent. My cool. Yeah, the cool. <laughs> cranks are <laughs> bent. Or you get on it. Yeah, I tried it out, and it, 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 <laughs> like it's bent in a way that it makes it feel like the bike's planing when yeah. you're just putting in. <laughs> it's like a hundred watts. It's like whoa. <laughs> this thing really <laughs> that's a that's a feature so, not a bug <laughs> if you're finding your bike isn't planning bend the bend crank the there you go <laughs> yeah. send in me i'll do it for you <laughs> I think I think for me like one thing I wish uh would come back with a slight modification is like the half step granny Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like I could just do it without like the half step and just have that big ring and then the the smaller inner. That's how I set up most of my personal bikes. Yeah. I think it makes the most sense like with a front derailleur because you, you essentially have, you know, two ranges of one by and like the shifting between is, you know, it's not like the current, um, you know, two by where there's some overlap, but here it's very distinct. So you've got like a, you know, flat or go fast one by range and then up in the mountains or touring range and that delineation is really clear that bailout is so nice to have and people freak out they're like you can't shift that you can you know, you <laughs> go you know i i run on my like gravel bike today i, I run a, a a 26 44 nice <laughs> and and everyone's like that doesn't shift and it, i'm like it shifts great you know every single time i think a lot of people uh I've, I've had like front trailers that don't shift that very well. And it's, it's counterintuitive also like the ones with the big drop cages for triples don't shift that don't, you need to have like an old school, you know, uh, double, you know, um, short cage, uh, no drop cage short, like, a like those old, uh, um, uh, here at Jubilee trailers work great for that. Mm -hmm. So I, I like, I prefer camping Noah record and things like that because old campy for him. But the, uh, but yeah, that, that's I didn't you say that the new um Shimano isn't didn't weren't you saying that the new Shimano group set has a kind of like a it, wide range double? Yeah, it's got a forty I think it's got a I want to say forty twenty six. So I'm actually excited about the that that front derailleur because on my hardtack I have a similar setup like forty two twenty six and a eleven eleven to forty in the rear, and it's just got bananas range. Um yeah, which is really nice that I love I like no matter if I'm on a real tough ride and you're out there and you know you've pushed the limits and you've gone further than your mind and body are supposed to take you or feel like taking you. If you have that bailout gear, it's, it means the world. <laughs> it's like such a safety net. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I remember um, I was talking with a uh, Jim from Soma because I was trying to convince him to come out with a, a wide range double, um, and he said like the biggest hurdle is the front derailleur. Mm -hmm. um that a lot of you know the machinery to to make those parts um you know they, 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 they'd have to get a new front derailleur cage stamped and the investment alone on that would be something like ten to fifteen thousand dollars so i know a lot of people listening here have been following grant's journey with the, with the front derailleur i mean with the rear derailleur yeah it's been riveting for me um and uh, <laughs> It has been. because it is he points out so many ways that it has it's so cost prohibitive and just just impossible to to make an affordable rear derailleur that's just normal you know, <laughs> I know. it's crazy <laughs> and people i get pe people messaging me um you know every once in a while like why you know like make uh make like a sun tour part again or this that and that and if those all those those mold, you know everything's been yeah. destroyed that this stuff doesn't exist anymore we don't have any choices yeah yeah we don't have any choices we're like no, why we, can't we make this in the u.s I'm we've like, worked well. on some fun engineering projects together because yeah. that's my background more so and <laughs> every time yeah. it, that stuff that stuff is so expensive to make yeah it's like those big companies are the ones who can do it mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. it's really hard to it's that's yeah. what it is that kind of they kind of lock us in and make it they're the ones steering the boat here with us yeah. with what if you're if you're in the market buying new components mm -hmm. or if you're a frame builder specking new components on mm -hmm. bikes like you do, you're you're at the whim of these these um mm -hmm. you know overseas manufacturers and some some of them crazy. take feedback pretty well i mean SRAM has been receptive to small brands like me mm -hmm. some occasionally but uh you know they're also 
they have different different goals. Right. <laughs> different goals, yeah. The alt cyclist is not is not a huge thing. We're maybe like a little sliver in the pie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is good. We can make our own economy, but yeah. we're, we're, no one I, I I do have this like pipe dream of um if there was a you know, if like a Velo Orange Soma and Rivendell like all came together as like a, a kind of nine speed coalition and just, <laughs> you know, could, could like come up with their own, like, you know, call it like the, the classic component you know, group set. Cool. Yeah, yeah, and we would just keep that stuff, you know, yeah. alive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I found it interesting. I, I've, I've started to, uh, I've, uh, really just last year I started, I used to be a huge um, road racing fan, like professional road racing fan followed the tour and all the classics and everything for most of my teenage life. And, and I, I just got jaded by it after the Lance era. And then I was just recently started watching again. And I love hearing Bob Roll's commentary because <laughs> you see like, the, cause you know, he's seen it all and you, you get like the, um, um, there's always people like breaking their chains. If you notice, and it, it's interesting. He's like, he'll, he'll say like, you, you, Oh, there you go. You know, you see someone attacking, they break their, their 12 speed or 13 speed chain or whatever. And you know, it's immediate it's like game over, you know? <laughs> and he's like, you see this more and more happening more and more every year. This never used to happen. And it's because they're trying to do 13 gear, 13 <laughs> gears. The chain is like a few millimeters thick. And it's eight. And he said right afterwards on uh, is eight is great. And nine is fine. <laughs> 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 that's all you need <laughs> yeah yeah but it's not us you know it's not it's not logic that's pushing the 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 bigger industry forward it's it's how can we innovate it's just innovation in coming out as we've touched on this before it's just imagine having to come out with something new every single year and being trapped in that that cycle mm-hmm. um and and having to sell it you know and that's a 13 that's how you get 13 speeds <laughs> right i mean I, I feel like the the bikes you know it's it's a mature product or it's been mature since let's say like the late late yeah. 90s early 20 2000, 2000s there wasn't really much more that could be truly improved upon and now they're kind of it's either cosmetic or just adding more of something else but no like big sweeping changes aside from like i think the tires the the fatter tires we've had in the in the last few years have probably been the biggest innovation yeah yeah that's been a really cool really cool innovation i like to think of innovation as far as like mechanical and i mean not mechanical what would you call that (laughs) 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 non-hydraulic without the suspension because obviously there's been a lot of innovation in suspension and suspension design full suspension design and mountain bikes and things like that and I think the big trickle down for us has been nice flat pedals, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um. I, mean, I think, you know, I'm a little bit more on, on the, there's some good stuff that's come out of it, but it is like with all, with companies pushing the electronic stuff, that's, yeah. that's a line that per, personally I won't cross. Yeah. Um, but there's some stuff, I mean, one by chain rings. I know we're talking about front derailers, but like <laughs> we used to run, I mean, even when I got into mountain biking and when I was in high school, like we were, we were running one bys and you had to do the bash guard and all that stuff. And it, it never worked. Mm-hmm. And nine speeds was fine for us then, but um, that's a good thing. <laughs> but handy, and those can be handy for like, if you're fixing up, like I'll do friends, get a bike at the bike co-op and we'll one by put like that. Who makes the cheap nine speed stuff? Um, micro shift. Micro shift. Get the micro mm-hmm. stuff. Like you can get yourself a pretty sweet bike for like less than five hundred dollars. So that's that's a cool thing, I think. Yeah, it's but you know it's like it's not it's those not all... the railers are terrible. They're yeah. so <laughs> they're hideous, but they work pretty good. <laughs> they work good, but it's like yeah, it can be a good intro to it's the like, sport. It's a good intro to the sport, but you could also just get a derailleur that already exists and put a, a wide range double on it. You can mm-hmm. like price. But it's also, but it then takes, it's, it's harder to share. It's more leverage. To to I think the one by, one, one by is really right. good for getting people One by is for, for beginners. One by is, is definitely easier. Yeah. yeah. I, will, I will admit That's that. actually, yeah, it's converted a lot of people to bikes. Yeah. Friends of mine. We're not big bike heads. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. But I guess as you, as, as your, as your taste <laughs> mature. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh, we can hope. <laughs> that's a taste mature yeah have you guys um are you guys familiar with the classified hub no no what's 
So it's a uh, it's a rear hub um, that has uh, planetary gears. That's electronic shifting, um, and it gives you a one to one or one to one on the big and the point seven. So it's basically you can get like a fifty thirty four, but it's uh, with a one by in the front. Um, only costs two grand. So to to replace the front derailleur um, <laughs> and a proprietary cassette. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything with these, I, that's my same issue with like a roll off hub or whatever. When you're adding like, you're adding like a pound or more of weight <laughs> to the rear, to your, to the rear of your bike, like exactly where you don't want it to be. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've had the, I know people love them, but I've, I've tried the pinion gearboxes and the roll off setups and just not like they're really hard to maintain. They're really heavy. Yeah. Really Typically heavy. the clunking there, the shifting is clunky. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I haven't found one that I could see replacing a derailleur yet. Yeah. Yeah. For me personally. Yeah. And it's something, you know, when you're just using a simple friction shed up, shed up, set up, with the, <laughs> you know, there's, there's few things that more, more, I don't think that could be, that system could be improved upon. It's just such a, uh, but yeah, I'm saying as far as you know, simplicity goes and like, if you're like a, a bike tourist who's in the market for something like a roll off hub, like you're looking for something like bomb proof and simple that you could repair in the field, like just, right. just run a, a, a three by eight, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, so, to fix that anywhere. 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 Not such like, yeah, bike yeah. And stuff. yeah, 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 so, yeah, be able to fix it. And, and that's what you, yeah, that's what you're using a roll off for. It's bike, it's bike touring people yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. or commuters. I mean, I guess commuters, I could yeah. see it for like commuting, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. all no these place on a crazy, mountain, all these like. All the, I, I have my another one of my pet peeves is uh, continuous housing, and uh, and so because those always have to be affixed with zip ties. So you know having having your shifting also be continuous housing, and that's extra weight also. You know it's also it's a, it's just way more friction on the cables. Mm -hmm. It's just not. Don't care. Yes. I've had um oh, I have yeah. a couple bikes with a. <laughs> And one thing I don't like about the continuous housing is if um, you change derailleurs, sometimes they have a different like angle of entry and you need like an extra four or five inches inches, and then you have to like, you know, either recable it or I discovered a, a new trick recently with those uh, double sided ferrules, you know, so they can they butt into each other and you can just add that little like tag end. Um, oh, that is a good trick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I set up a. Which is handlebars every. Every week, that's good. <laughs> that's that's why I did it. I have a, a bike that I swap between uh, alt bars and drop bars, and I trim them uh, where they yeah. come into the frame, and just use the double ended ferrules, and it's like a hot swap uh, for, the, the for ferrule, like the Richie breakaway type things. Or no, like it's it's literally like a like a ferrule, but it it'll accept two uh, housing housing ends. Gotcha. Um, so if you have a bike with continuous housing and, and no stops, it allows you to kind of fake a stop. Gotcha. I had a, um, a bike set up between drop bars and flat bars, and I would use, well, it wasn't continuous housing. It used those Richie breakaway um, cable, quick, connect. Uh, quick connect things. And I was like, yeah, I'm only going to have one bike and just switch out the handlebars. And it worked great. I just, just the idea of having one bike was a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta have at least five, ten, ten at least. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we're, and I'm gonna assume that we might be all in the same club with a uh, electronic shifting. Like, what are your reasons for maybe not cro you know crossing over on your personal bikes? Oh, for me, I've had it on a few personal bikes, and it shifts great. It's light. It's cool, but I've run into the thing where like I forget to charge my battery. Mm -hmm. And I go on a ride and my bike doesn't shift and <laughs> is enough. For me. Like, I just don't want to, that's the whole point of bikes to me is to not have to think about that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So that's pretty much it. I think functionally it's a great, it's great. And to have a one by 12 option is, is awesome for a lot of people. Um, I've used it mostly on my mountain bike too, which um, in Bozeman, you have to drive to a lot of the trails. And so, it turns on when it jiggles. So on the back of your car, you, so you end up going through a bunch of that. Or if you're driving across the country, you'll show up like you drove to go to Arizona to ride mountain bikes and you show up and your batteries are dead. It just was a little, I think, I think most people, a lot of people who have it, it wouldn't be an issue, but I just really like not thinking about my bike. Um, 
So that, that's mostly it for me. I mean, it's also, it's really expensive. Um, so if you break something, you're on the hook for a lot. And, you know, there's there's only three options out there for it. So yeah. those, mostly I just, I, I like my bikes to, I don't like to spend time working on my bikes really. And I like them to work when I want to go ride them. So that, that's the big thing for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about you, Ron? Yeah, for me, believe it or not, I have I've put in some time on electronic shifting. I had a, a back in the specialized days, they sent me um, like that one of those chameleon diverges with the with the DI two, and um, um, I put on I, I decided to ride at JFF and <laughs> did, did some probably did like three or four rides on it. Just this is nice to know. I always like to uh, go back and try like really normal bikes just to see if. <laughs> how far you know it's always nice to have like a limiter like a governor of some some sort you're like okay have i gone too far <laughs> <laughs> and so i'll you know i'll try something normal for a little bit just to kind of feel it and um you know i was it, it shifts fast it may, i don't like the i don't like that that noise the noise that it makes the sound that it makes mm-hmm it's I kind of like that. it kind of takes but, me out. Zoot, zoot, zoot. <laughs> a little bit it makes me feel it makes remind me of how ridiculous i am uh, and uh, uh so you know that's the uh or that, yeah each and then, and then of course to to randall's point you know the i've you hear about you know you know since its inception about oh yeah it, 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 the battery life is long. You know, it lasts. You just you have know, to carry an extra, extra battery. 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 It's not a big deal. <laughs> I have seen every single person. I, I mean, any person that I know that uses electronic shifting. I've been on a ride where they've ran out of battery. And has to have to ride. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, like we we ride dynamos because we can't remember to charge our headlights. You know, right. it, <laughs> that's just how it goes. And I'd say like Weigel and Chapman were able to incorporate it and have their dynamo charge the the system which i think Ah, that's pretty cool um and um um, chapman uh, i want to say had like an original di2 kit that he used on his personal bike until very until one of the one of i think until the nor'easter this past year and he he ripped his derailleur like off like (laughs) oh no yeah it was like (laughs) and so and that was he had that thing hooked up to his to his uh dynamo and never had and That's so cool. I think adding something like that to it is really cool. Um, I think I think SRAM just filed a some kind of patent with like a dynamo in one of the pulley wheels or something. We'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll yeah. figure that out. But um, you know, so the uh, going back to the main, it's the aesthetic. Like they all have that big chunky, um, you know, uh, Wi-Fi the battery on the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just looks so not, i mean not it's just not clean it's just not a yeah. good look yeah yeah it makes it makes it look um look much more like a uh yeah, it's just you people you buy you're trying to make your bike look perfect like this and and you know people don't think that that looks good like no, <laughs> you know like they're just like well that's all that's available you know yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you know no one's looking at that and being like oof but people think it's cool. I I'll, I'll bring back GRX. No one's looking at GRX. <laughs> yes. Yeah, some of the electronic stuff, I feel like it's it's going to age as well as like a VHS player. You right. know, it's just, it's a consumer electronic. Um, it's a consumer electronic. You're right. And, that, and that's how components are designed these days, unfortunately. That's, yeah, that's the frustrating part about it. Yeah. You're yeah. not going to find those in the bike co op in, right. no way. in 15 years. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's, a, it's a single yeah. use, um, you know, consumer. Pr- Consumer electronic product, mm-hmm. like a yeah. air, fryer. <laughs> air fryer that ships. <laughs> I mean, for me, like my, you know, I've I've tried uh, mostly SRAM uh, electronic shift. It's fine. I mean, I feel like it's a little like soulless. But my biggest kind of hurdle is that once you go electronic, I mean, you're you're stuck in the ecosystem. You know, it's all proprietary, and I feel like you know. You know, they, they can turn off the switch and disable things or, you know, whatever. Whereas mm-hmm. with, you know, with mechanical stuff, you can mix and match, you know, thing, do things you're not supposed to do. But once you're in that electronic shifting ecosystem, there's all your choice is gone, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> unless yeah. you're like really, you know, unless you're like danger home or something and can right. like rig up buttons, you know, like, you know, like, like behind your ear. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, that stuff's pretty cool. If you, but the uh, but you've got to be it's, yeah it's a skill tough, set that tough for the has. tinkerer yeah. i mean i think a lot of the bikes i design really are for people who want a bike for one thing 
and I guess to say, I mean, yeah, I probably wouldn't use it, but I, the bikes I do put it on, those people, it, it doesn't take that much maintenance and mm-hmm. you kind of have it on there and it gets you 12 speeds and you don't have to worry about, a lot of people are the opposite of us where they're not trying to do <laughs> anything. Right. And it, right. I think it would keep those people well. Yeah, yeah. To your point, to I, ruin this, this ruin funny this conversation. Funny conversation. <laughs> <laughs> to your point, I, I can't think of like the people that I know. Even if I've seen, witnessed them running out of batteries on the, yeah. on the ride, they still swear by the. Yeah, <laughs> didn't, it didn't quite work for me. But <laughs> I know lots of people. Yeah. And my my only uh, my other issue with with uh, some of the new components is um, um, it affects frame design. Yeah. You know. So it would be it would be one thing if like there was electronic shifting and the hydraulic, but you also had the choice of mechanical. But you know the you know the big bike manufacturers build frames to the current components, mm-hmm. and if they're optimized for hydro, sometimes like the housing run to the rear brake sucks. Uh, if you're running a, a clamper, sometimes there's no cable stops at all. Um, so it it you know it takes things away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm finding that with all these with the wireless frames I'm building every time I'm like. Do I put cable guides on there for a derailleur? <laughs> for my bikes, I would. It also looks really clean when you don't put them yeah. on there yeah. for, the, for that first photo shoot. But then I hate it's like use guides. I know I hate yeah. it. I hate yeah. to see it. And also, I want the bike to be like every bike I build. I'm hoping it's still getting ridden in 20 years. So it's good to future proof them with mechanical routing. I think. Right. right. Yeah. If you, yeah <laughs> Especially yeah. like you know, someone will give it to their kid to take to college someday, and they'll put a yeah. cues derailleur on there <laughs> or someone could be listening to this and being like i don't want electronic stuff anymore <laughs> one building i'm specking i've been specking a ton of bikes with that uh the um uh, uh, uh what's the guys are doing the fins the shifter fins a oh, ratio uh, ratio yeah the ratio stuff and we're yep in our own mechanical 12 speed and we're <laughs> the on there so that's been a lot of the bikes i've been making which is cool because that's how i built yeah that's a cool that's a cool way to do it and i think that like that's a good like you're getting the best the best of the modern stuff Mm -hmm. and it's still everything we want with being serviceable and all that that is the yeah yeah Yeah. so adam i think we we chatted about this like a a little last time we visited but like how do you i mean you're a big fan of co-ops and practical bikes how do you reconcile that with like super high-end builds (laughs) um that's an interesting question uh (laughs) I mean, I think it's really cool. I feel like privilege. I feel privileged yet that I get to build these super bikes. It's not really what I thought I would be doing when I started making frames. Um, what was the first frame that you made? What were it? What were or... the first frame I made was a lugged cross bike <laughs> that was so bad that I didn't. I never even put parts on it. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I, I made it. I had no idea what I was doing, and I brought it over to Walt Works, mm-hmm. who was down the street from me. And he felt bad for me, and he gave me a grazing lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and then you probably envisioned that you would just be making bikes for friends, or, or did you know you yeah, had something you I didn't, to do right away? I didn't want it to be a business, because all the frame builders I talked to said, don't do this as a business, it's too hard. But I was really obsessed with it, so mm-hmm. I was making my friends' bikes, and then So what was no like money. the first like really <laughs> high-end build that you did had to do on a bike? Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure that was like a moment when you were like, someone's willing to spend thousands and thousands and yeah. thousands of dollars to build out one of my bikes Gosh, I, don't know. I, don't remember. I mean i remember for canadian mark i did like his oh yeah yeah a fancy single speed which is how um how we, how we met yeah yeah okay. shout out to canadian mark if you yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> but uh yeah there are a few like when it started getting to put like cool paul stuff on there and mm-hmm. you're like oh oh these okay. bikes look yeah. nice with all these cool parts on here uh, <laughs> pretty validating experience um, like it's pretty validating when people want to put like really nice stuff on yeah and bike. the frames i have figured out how to make a really nice frame which is cool mm-hmm. but i guess to that question i mean it is it is tough because it's hard to they're they have to be so expensive and because there's so much care put into them and so this super something project was really my emotional response to that to make bikes for my friends that i could in good conscience say like Oh, you're not a super hardcore cyclist, because um, the bikes are expensive. But I think they're they're reasonable for what they are, and the people who buy them, it's a big part of their life. And I, you know, that's a a, a priority that they take care of by buying a fancy bike. But um, the super somethings are cool because they're way more affordable, and mm-hmm. 
serve a lot more people. I think. So that's that's really why I, why I went down that road. Do you have, um, is there another production run on order, order or do you have another um, production bike that you're going to come out with? Yeah, I have another batch of Super Somethings on the way and those should be here in August. And then there is, I'm working on a mountain bike frame right now that will be here hopefully by the end of the year. Right. So excited to make some more, more approachable bikes for more people that I think are really fun and cool. And we are really are in a golden era of, bikes of small bike companies like this if you think yeah. about it we were just making a list at at while well, we were sipping coffee yesterday <laughs> but we came i think off the top of our head we came up with about 15 or so yeah and you know you don't ha and they're you know they're not surly cheap but they're you know in they're not you know they're if, if people are thinking about spending if you look at the price of like a big bike company when they're selling a carbon frame or something or you know, it's three thousand dollars for you know the frame fork or something or even more it's quite affordable when you think about that and there's all these options now you don't have to buy from a big brand mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which is really cool yeah uh what what uh what bike frame what small uh bike frame manufacturers are you guys excited about these days hmm. how small like hand handmade or uh, let's say that the, so I guess I'd be curious, like someone that offers maybe like a semi-production run. Okay, um, let's see. I always got to give a shout out to Rivendell and Crust, obviously. Yeah. Rivendell, <laughs> we, we surmise Rivendell. We're saying Rivendell and maybe Black Mountain have been doing it the longest. Yeah, they've been doing their own want, thing with no regard yeah, for what somebody in the, in the comments cool. will say something different, maybe. I, but I, I thought I dated Black Mountain back pretty far. I couldn't quite remember. But there's a bunch of ones that were out there. Rawland was out there uh, early on too, which ended up being some pretty cool bikes. I'm not sure what they're doing now, mm -hmm. if anything. But um, yeah, um, a lot of the from the new ones. I think. I mean, I'll say I'll say Crust. I really love what Crust has done. Yeah. They've been inspiring for what I'm doing now. Um, I'm partial. So it's like... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, there's that brand that is singular they're they're starting to ship in the in the u.s right yeah. now, them. singular that's a uk brand right yeah and they were were they around for are they new or have they been around for a little i bit? feel like they've been around for a while but they're they're just starting to creep around this side uh -huh. of the pond uh -huh. yeah i remember they made like a single speed 29er back when i was getting into bikes mm -hmm. um there's a lot of cool uk brands doing mountain mountain bike stuff that um are cool to see really small brands oh sour that brand's cool they're i think they're german huh they're doing some cool stuff uh, i'm trying to think of like readily available taiwan made frames and i i on when i i do the instagram for ultra dynamico so it's uh when if i go through the dms it's tagged in all these different bike builds yeah. and stuff. i get to see a lot which is mm -hmm. Is a cool there's a canadian brand uh called bossy i was gonna mention mm -hmm. that i feel like they they kind of do like have this like cross check vibe but mm -hmm. slightly I, I do it's nice colorful frames the hogs back or something i think that's what it's called yeah bossy. um there's a uh, blocks i see a lot of them in malaysia seemingly huh. b-l-o-c-s these are really colorful i want to say like heavily influenced by crust obviously like mm -hmm. really colorful um steel you know, mm -hmm. bikes. Um, there, who else was doing? Somebody else I noticed was started to do rim brakes too. Um, which is, I love that. I love. That. I love that. I I've back. got a, I've got a crazy bike from a, from Shell Money that's mm -hmm. got a. I posted a picture of it, but he's got it. He. I, I saw that photo. That was. Very he designed this. Crazy. Yeah, this plate that'll take seven hundred six fifty B twenty six, and it's also got um, uh, IS uh, mounts for discs. <laughs> Now, see to us with the, with the all the same yeah time. with make, make, it, make it stops I could never I could never but I, that's that's intriguing that's a very like surly ogre type of uh, I, I am gonna do a video with uh, running four brakes at the same time it's just <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to find road brake levers uh, I guess uh, I want to say Mayfac made like a tandem uh, yeah. with like yeah. that pulled two cables mm -hmm. but I you know I might. I, I know Paul, that there's like a Paul dual Paul cable has. like BMX thing that you can do. So Paul, yeah, Paul has those dual cable ones. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. You put like four of those 
Ja, men okay, <laughs> we need to pull. Yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff going on right now. Yeah. I, I think uh, the the landscape is very, uh, very fruitful. Uh, is, that, is that a good way to describe it? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, you know, it's it is like a, we could do our our own own thing here. And there's a lot of small small brands making their own making their own stuff and mm-hmm. making it you know, outsourcing it, doing it in other places, just like the world has become so much smaller because of what we, you know, the contacts we're able to make. And, and, uh, oh, you want to know the small, um, beach club. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Love Sean Talkington and we love beach club. And I have a beach club road bike even now. And nice. those have all been made by Darren and in, 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 um, deep river, Connecticut, across the river from me. But, um, he's, I think he might be moving in a different direction also. So um, I think he's got some really good style. Probably has some good designs coming out. But mm. oh, I got a oh squid. I like what squid. Oh squid, doing yeah, too. yeah, yeah. Aluminum mm-hmm. also. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like very much doing like well, and also their fixies are. I think those are Taiwan, mm-hmm. but those are cool. That it's just they've popularized the whole track low cross thing. I think that's fun. Yeah, they really just, stuck with it too. Yeah, they really yeah. stuck with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's fun. We we're scorchers. We're scorchers. We, yeah, we're, we're all about it. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> so both of you guys had the experience of coming out with a, a a production frame. How much how much does it cost? Like I'm curious. Like let's say someone's got a wild idea for a bike. Like how much capital would they have to to put in for like a, at least like a the minimum amount of frames? Um, well, rounds are made in the U.S. by Frank the Welder. Yeah, and a little bit smaller production. So. The different, yeah, so it, it is interesting because I've been privy to Matt's, across Matt's whole journey through Taiwan and all of the, you know, it's, 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 I've, I've said before, like the day I met him, I was like, there's no way he could own a bike company. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, and, and, uh, inspired me all along because I was like, wow. he was like, he was the first person who like made me realize that you don't have to be, Mike Sinyard, you know, and right. And so, um, you know, the uh, for me, I I think the people who have um, responded and bought my frame sets are a lot of them are Frank the Welder fans and have similar like bike trajectories as me. Maybe they raced on a, you know, in the '90s and really, you know, coveted a spooky frame or something or a mm-hmm. or a Yeti frame that you may have made or they were really big John Tomac or Missy Giobi fans made all mm-hmm. those and. Um, you know, he's got a, a, quite the legacy that comes along with it. And for me to be able to offer a bike built by him, because I consider him one of the best, if not the best builder, you know, uh, in the world, you know, it's just like a cool, he's just a production guy. He doesn't think of it as an art form. He's just out right. there producing. And uh, that's the big difference with him um, is if you want like a, a, a frame from, you know, Weigel or Saks or something, you're going to spend triple, quadruple, you know, even 10 times as much. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have to wait years. Or it's right. get by Frank right now, and it's going to be something weird because I made it, <laughs> <laughs> and so and so the uh, so you don't have to get something custom. So you know, I I think with me working with Frank, and uh, I loved how refresh. It's just cool to work with somebody just um, two hour a two hour drive away. I don't have to worry about the logistics, shipping, and shipping containers across that. Like the stuff that we have to do for our tire company. It's like mm-hmm. if, like if I have a, a problem, I call him up we fix it right away. It's not, if I have a problem with the tire company, uh, Patrick usually handles it. <laughs> <laughs> problem with the tire company it is, it is, it, you know, weeks of Patrick losing sleep and losing more hairs and you know, all the, all, you know, we, we, early on, we realized that this was going to age us significantly. So we made sure we keep that stuff on the face. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yeah, it's a, a lot, a lot different. Um, I like that because Frank is production oriented and not an art and, you know, doesn't call himself an artist. I'm able to get the price down, um, which is, you know, and you have to, of course we did 55 of the Illuma lifts and, um, and it was, so the price break, of course, and more frames you, you get, but um, it was doing stuff in the U S is very cost prohibitive. And that's why people don't do it. You know, you really have to have some sort of, I feel like having that, having that, that Frank, um, um, je ne sais quoi to it, Frank. 
<laughs> it's, it's like is the selling point i think i don't think people would buy it otherwise because it would just be any old um american frame builder who could be anybody you yeah, know it's, special. it's not special, it's special. yeah because yeah. it, it's frank it's special and uh mm-hmm. so it's a, it's a unique position i don't know if i could have could have sold it for the, for the same so yeah easy stuff with with randall it's a lot different yeah Pretty, yeah i mean doing stuff in taiwan has been uh learned a lot so the first batch just got here and i mean time-wise it took it took about two years to get from so you have to pay first you're paying for tooling and um you know i think there's a lot of companies out there like you can if you want to go to use an agent or a factory in taiwan you can kind of be like here's the geometry i want here's the roughly the tubing i want but um i'm able to like draw the dropouts and design my own cable guides and head tubes and all my tubing and all the bends and all that stuff so I had to have a lot of tooling done. And so that process took months and a bunch of money. And then you get some samples. And then this was kind of at the tail end of all the pandemic supply chain <laughs> stuff. So normally, I mean, five years ago, you could have gotten a batch of frames in four months. And when I I did it, it was up to like 12 months. So that took a long time. Now it's down to six or eight months. Um, okay. Yeah. And so... Um, I mean, that, that must be a little bit of a, a puckery moment to have that much capital held up, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's way more. I like wired more money to Taiwan than I've ever had in my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really, it is. Really, it, it is you really putting yourself out there. It's a big, all these, all these uh, projects are big investments, and none yeah. of us are rich people by any means. Like, we don't, you know, we, this is not, you know, just like a play thing, you know? And so it, it does, it's like, a, yeah, it's like, you lose sleep you will yeah it's very very stressful and yeah, even yeah. like i mean just recently the like the frames showed up and um i knew that they had left taiwan and then a few days later they had arrived in los angeles and i was calling my freight company like every day I'm like where are they and they're like we don't know there was no <laughs> response. like i emailed them like twice a day and, like all my money is on a boat in los angeles and the last week of work is on a boat in a shipping container yeah and I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything for three weeks. And then one day I got a call. It was like, hey, I got a bunch of bikes for you. Are you at the shop? And <laughs> they all just showed up completely unannounced. Yeah. Oh, so geez. three weeks, like, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Mm-hmm. We'll get like yeah. buyers in that same way. All of, they just show up. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, what? And then it's like, it's a whole semi full. Yeah. They're like, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> and the, you get asked people about the handlebars and stuff that I do with crust and we don't know things just show up like yeah. like when you get stuff from overseas it gets put on that shipping container and they don't like you don't know if it's on there or not you know <laughs> it gets it gets there and and then you don't know how long it's going to sit there before they end up actually bringing it to you mm-hmm. it's just you hear about it when you hear about it and oftentimes it's not until the day before and um, and then um contrary working with 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 frank i go he calls me and i mm-hmm. tr- drive two hours north and pick up stuff and drive it back you have a little more communication, <laughs> a little more communication. <laughs> if i want a sample like the, the, he just made this really cool gravel bike for me that i've been teasing a little bit that we're probably going to do a run of and i i said oh when i picked up the illumilis he was like come into the back room i hear you want to do something else and i was like okay <laughs> And I told him, and I was like, well, I'm leaving for Arizona in three weeks. He's like, heck, I can make this for you next week. Nice. You know? but it's, like, <laughs> it's like, hello, I'm, 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 I'm in heaven. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But also, yeah, it's tough. But you look at, you you look at the numbers in Taiwan, and it's, you yeah. know, here in a box ready to ship, it's less than the cost of materials. It's insane. And, yeah, yeah. And it's a really, really, really nice bike. Like, mm-hmm. it was cool. I rode one all, I've been riding one for a year now, and it's i knew they'd be nice but they're way nicer than i thought it's cool that it's it's a really nice bike yeah. and i'm i'm super excited you have to think about in taiwan too like they are production oriented like they this is what they do it's a city it's set a, up of yeah. factories just <laughs> they're owned by family it's like fa- they're all family, family owned. business they're yeah it's cool to businesses like... and this is what they do like yeah that, that nobody in the u.s can touch them as far as quality even i mean yeah, they're, yeah. they're really nice but you have to but they're not again they're not artists so you have to be very like they'll make you have to be very specific right. in certain ways. They just send them yeah. highly dimensioned drawings. Yeah, because they'll do something totally whack and you'll be like, 
<laughs> you know, it'll be done well, but whack. <laughs> yeah, that's a really cool part about doing it. And I've worked with other American manufacturers too. We get to have the conversation about it, but it is, um, yeah, you gotta, it's, it's handy being an engineer where I can like send a drawing. It's a big and, advantage you have. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. He draws most of ours. Like if I have something that I want to make with crust or if Matt does, uh, Randall's the one that draws it for us. So mm-hmm. it's a huge, it's a big advantage in owning a bike company is mm-hmm. if you're able to do all that stuff, all that technical drawings and all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. Makes us yeah. harder. Than we, can. <laughs> <laughs> we just started, uh, you know, dipping our toes in, in some merch and, you know, getting caps made in Japan and like the outlay isn't, probably nearly as much as a as a frame but still it's a lot for us and like yeah, as totally. you know, someone that has you know like a, a boutique or small bike business you assume a lot of financial risk or just just risk in general um which i feel like you know a lot of people sometimes the end user doesn't get like why is this so expensive it's like well because i put you know a big chunk of my savings into this and it's got to work out but <laughs> If you want it cheap, it's out there cheap. You could find it from yeah. people who, you know, are faith, faceless companies. But, you know, you, yeah, we put a lot of time and effort into this stuff and, mm-hmm. and it costs a lot of money. It's a yeah. big <laughs> risk. Yeah. 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 Um, what if John Prawley doesn't post this picture? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so we're at the hour. If you guys are. I, for some reason, my counter isn't telling me how many people are in the chat. But if you guys, there's some number of people in the chat. Uh, if you guys have any questions before we log off, uh, quickly put it in the comment box and I'll, I'll pass it along. Um, what else? Um, so Super Somethings, uh, you've got a, you said August is the next uh, drop. Um, I'm gonna get get one to test for the channel, hopefully. <laughs> right, that's right. Yeah, which co- which color? Back. Which color? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, do you have uh, what are the choices? <laughs> Blue or yellow? Yellow. <laughs> Everyone likes the yellow. The yellow is really yeah. nice. It's, it's one of those colors you don't expect people to like so much, but it's it's impossible not to like it when you look down at it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll have a. There is a super secret special opportunity to get some super somethings next month oh <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> more about that? i don't think i'm allowed to say anything more but there'll be a few very cool ones special paint maybe yeah. some special paint possibly are you guys gonna go out to sea otter i will be i might be there briefly yep yeah I'm doing sea otter i think just for sunday and then we're going to patrick and i are flying to japan from there to for a uh, pan eraser factory visit. Cool. So, uh, getting down and dirty in bike industry stuff. Well, yeah. Just jet setting and big industry guys. Big industry. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All that. Just. <laughs> <laughs> I just write checks. Right. <laughs> Travelers check this one. You take Diners Club. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be at a Sea Otter making bids. Uh, but we're also going to stop by um, Soma and check in on um, the the friction shifter that we're we're yeah, working on with them. Um, What's the who, who is so? Can you explain to us who is the face of? I mean, who is Soma? Uh, Soma is a, a brand of Mary, Mary, Mary Sales. Sales. It's Mary Sales. I order a lot of stuff from Mary Sales. We love Mary Sales. We love Mary Sales, but I want to know who Soma is. Because they've been, that's been around for a long, that's, I mean, we're talking Taiwanese frames and someone's been doing it for a long time too. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'll, I'll ask, we're going to make a video with uh, Soma slash Mary Sales when we get there. So I can, I can suss I that out. To, I want you to ask the tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Soma? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got um, Jim over at uh, Soma Mary Sales. Um, we're, we're working on a, an updated version of the Nitto F16, like a rackless uh, rack thing uh, or support. Yeah, and yeah, he just yeah. got a, I think a 3D print or I don't know, some prototype of it um, that we're going to be taking a look at also. That's neat so. what they could do with three 3D printing prototypes nowadays is pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. Know. First with your dropouts, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
Fuck you. He's millennial. Running Gen Z. He's not even 30 yet. Look, and he's single. <laughs> okay, so we have a, a couple of questions. Uh, Charlie Metcalf, uh, Ronnie is uh, Ronnie has some bikes with Crest Cycles, but isn't Crest Cycles that'd be Matt? Uh, and Randall is uh, Sklar, Sklar Bikes. Sklarbikes.com? Sklarbikes.com. At Sklarbikes. That's S K L A R. <laughs> nice. And then uh, someone asks, uh, carbon fiber, material revolution, or useless environmental... I mean, I feel like this could be a whole video on its own, but uh, <laughs> at the... <laughs> um, I don't know. What's, what are your think, thoughts on... I, I think just about... I think everything at this point is an environmental disaster, <laughs> and we should stop right. calling it that. I mean, <laughs> certainly, like, the, like the, there are environmental disasters, but we are, like, such trash balls at this point that we might as well just... Really going dark, but yeah, I guess carbon fiber. It, uh, it's yeah, it's it's the long it's the longevity. I guess it's just I think we have such reverence for parts bins and things like that, and yeah. and being able to make something that like if you're going to put your name on it, you want it to be around in 20, 20 years, twenty thirty years even. You know, and I think that's the big difference with carbon fiber being a, a disposable material like by design it's you know five year lifespan really mm -hmm. and um and, the, and you know it's just a, it's gimmicky it's you know it's you know you go on and on it's a cool material but yeah I, I i as someone who makes bikes i think i prefer to make stuff that lasts a long time and it's I just think, a lot yeah, yeah and you can make a bike that rides really good and lasts a long time out of other materials yeah yeah. I should say environmental disasters produced by bicycles. I mean, we could point, we could go other places with that. Yeah. You know, it's, we're still even a carbon fiber bike is pretty low on the on the list as far as that goes. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that would be like a determining factor for me. Yeah, I and mean, it probably takes less energy to manufacture a carbon. True. Frame. Yeah, you know, you could just punch them out of a mold too. Yeah, you yeah. punch them out of a mold. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, figure out a way that they could. What we need is the Calfee bamboo bike. There you go. <laughs> well, so, Ron, here's a. Uh, Shout out to Katie Jesus. His joke was with Cal Calfee bamboo bikes. Who whoever asked for that? Nobody. Yeah. It's, it's just <laughs> always there. <dead. laughs> Here's a question for you, Ron. How's it working with a tire manufacturer that has their own line of tires? Is it a con conflict of interest slash competition oh. with Pan Racer? Or are they like whatever? It's money's money. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good. Uh, it's a good question. I have a, had a totally new insight into that too with our bag company because because we are a, a bag, like a bag factory manufacturer and we make stuff for other people also. And so it's all about filling in the holes. Like you want, you've got employees and you want to keep them busy. So you want to keep that, you know, Panda Racer can't f fill all of its, you know, there's room. They wouldn't have taken us on if there wasn't room. They right. say that they're not taking on anyone else. I don't know how true that is, but the, but you know, it's, it takes a specific in investment in the beginning and everything. And Panda Racer being a Japanese brand, um, and being like a, they have a lot of, um, a lot of ties to bicycle culture and things like that. And they really, um, I found it when I initially, um, approached them about doing tires, like they, you know, I'm sure they did a little research and I had to like show them like what kind of idea was and things like that. And like what our branding was going to be and and they were, and they liked our ideas and the branding and they liked my own personal brand at the time. And so they wanted to work with us. And so it, it was kind of like these fun projects for them. Um, I know they do, you know, they do Renee Hearst, they do, um, uh, Simworks, they do, uh, Bruce Gordon, rock and road. Um, I could go back thinking like, uh, Pan Racer making tires for Tioga back in the day, the farmer, John, the psycho, like, I don't know if the psycho was made by Pan Racer, but farmer John was, I believe. There's a lot of like Pan Racers always made tires for other companies. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're, that's, it's nothing new for them. They've, they've done it since, you know, for as long as I've been into bikes and they have so many different, uh, casing options and, uh, rubber options. It's like an infinite number of, of variables that go into every tire. And so a lot of people do, I do, I mean, probably think that a tire is a tire 
it says panda racer on the side why is this any different than a gravel game or something but there's a lot that goes into it a lot of different um very as you know as you get more and more of a connoisseur you'll start feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> but the but it's uh you know it's it's one of those things where uh um, panda racer while they don't always focus entirely on us um as like their number one uh, obviously their own tires are their number one goal but you know so our stuff might take a little bit longer they might not prioritize us um but overall um they see it as a, as a win-win because they get to have their um, product still be relevant by and have other people promote it and it fills in their factory time and and make it uh keep their employees busy yeah 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 cool uh well i think i'm gonna take it home just so you guys can enjoy your your lovely campsite in the sunshine <laughs> <laughs> we're like huddled in the, we're the shade. I'm cold. You can see the that's the sun. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, so thanks everyone for joining us on the the live stream. Uh, definitely check out uh, Randall's Randall's <laughs> the curveball <laughs> at uh, sklarbikes.com. Um, and Ron, really Ron, cool. you've got a, a YouTube channel now too, right? So people can I find it. i Russ. You, I got to hand it to you. This is a, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to get a video on there once a month. Yeah, yeah, but it's you know, it's it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. I hand yeah. it to you. You don't have, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's <dark. laughs> I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. And as always, everybody, keep the supple side down. <laughs>